to be. I think that means it's on. Okay, cool. Uh, so thanks so much for the introduction. It's really a, a privilege to be here. It's rare that I go to a meeting and really learn something really valuable with every conversation I've had. So this has been quite a great conference. Um, I'm excited to talk today a little bit about manipulating excitations, particularly in magnetic oxides, and these are compensated systems. So it's along with the theme of the conference. I am slightly diverging from the flow a little bit. There's not a ton of X-ray in this uh, talk, but I think the other Coretta who actually spoke earlier uh, this morning covered enough for the both of us, so that's good. Um, so uh, what we're talking about today is magnetic excitations, and so what do I mean by those? I, what I'm talking about is really non-collinear spin textures, things like domain walls in 1D, skirmions in 2D, and even more elementary excitations like uh, spin waves and magnons. And once again, I thank Peter and Claire for really nicely introducing uh, spin textures in this session already. What I'm particularly excited about, which I think is a little different, is actually our ability to manipulate these uh, systems, do dynamics, and ultimately control their propagation as well. So what I'll tell you today is how we can really use these ferroic excitations, and specifically in oxide materials. And the reason we're using oxide materials is because they have a vast number of novel functionalities that we can take advantage of. Things like non-trivial band structures, some of these have been mentioned in this conference already, correlated phenomenon, and I think what's also very key is the ability to really precisely atomically engineer these structures and their interfaces uh, for desired functionalities. And hopefully this lends itself to some new materials physics, which I'll talk about today. But the key to all this is really, once again, the ability to grow materials with atomic precision combined with what I'll show you today is some in situ uh, characterization, mainly electronic characterization and some imaging. So if you get nothing from today's talk, uh, just take away this slide, how the power of both uh, growing atomically precise systems combined with this in situ characterization in oxides can lead to some pretty fun things. So with that, here's the outline for the talk today. I'll spend most of my time actually talking about a garnet oxide system, so something that may be more familiar uh, to this crowd, a very historic system, but I'll show you how by engineering these materials correctly, by growing them correctly, you can actually uh, excite dynamics so fast you hit new physics. So we'll look at relativistic dynamics in these systems. And then uh, at the last part of the talk, I added this in because there's so much wealth of knowledge here on magnons and spin waves. I'll show you some very, very recent work that we've done on our ability to actually control magnon propagation with electric fields in correlated perovskite oxides. And of course, the underlying theme will be highlighted throughout the talk. And so I'll first start uh, with uh, relativistic dynamics. So I'm an engineer by training, so I always think to applications. And what was nicely uh, portrayed earlier in this session by, by Peter um, was racetrack memory. And so uh, I'll remind you a few things. I won't try to cover what Peter already covered, but I'll remind you that most data on Earth is actually still stored magnetically, either through hard disk drive or actually tape is still used predominantly, particularly in the cloud. And so we essentially use the magnetic state of one or a few grains uh, to represent one or zero bits of information. And while this is really dirt cheap and incredibly dense, we all know that there are some dramatic disadvantages in terms of the robustness and the speed of these types of networks. So one proposed alternative is perhaps instead of using physical discrete bits that actually physically move in a system to something more solid state where you have a continuous magnetic media where you have magnetic domains, which are separated by finite transition regions, which are domain walls. So if you can move these domain walls, you can effectively move bits in solid state with no moving parts. And this has, of course, been conceptualized in more than just one dimension, two dimensions like skirmions, and I fail to mention here 3D systems as well. But more than just memory, domain walls have also been looked at for things like uh, logic as well, neuromorphic applications, which I also fail to show on this slide. And so how do we actually manipulate these textures? Well, today the most popular way to do that, and probably one of the more efficient ways to do that, is by using spin orbit torques, which has been very nicely introduced uh, in the, uh, throughout the conference, so I won't cover this in detail. But we essentially use spin accumulation in uh, materials with large spin orbit couplings, so heavy metals, 5D transition metal oxides, TIs, or even magnetic materials, which has been shown uh, also throughout the week, can uh, have uh, very strong spin hall angles. Uh, and so essentially by placing a magnetic material next to one of these spin to charge converters, we can convert a charge current into angular momentum and excite dynamics and drive these spin textures into motion. 
And we've known this for essentially a decade. It's been used to switch the magnetization of bits and even drive domain walls into motion as well. And so the canonical or classic system that's been used to study domain wall dynamics for a number of years is really an all metallic system. It's quite elemental in nature. So we use a spin over coupled material like platinum, which is used most of the time with usually a, an elemental ferromagnetic metal, something like cobalt, nickel, or iron, or some basic alloy uh, of these uh, materials. And this system actually has a number of advantages. Uh, so this interface between the two gives rise to perpendicular magnetic anisotropy, which is great for scaling and efficiency. And I think importantly for domain wall dynamics, this interface also gives rise to a strong dzhalzhinsky maria interaction, or DMI, which uh, stabilizes uh, chiral nail domain walls. And in fact, the nail domain wall is actually a necessary ingredient for spin over torque driven motion of domain walls. In fact, the strength of the torque is actually proportional to the uh, nail component of that domain wall. So without a nail domain wall, you can't drive a domain wall with a spin over torque. And so this system works, uh, works pretty well. You can drive domain walls to a few hundred meters per second, which seems pretty fast. Um, but what we've learned over the years is that, in fact, there's a, a plateau or a saturation of the velocity at high current densities. And this is actually fundamental to ferromagnetic systems. It actually depends on the strength of the DMI in your material. And so this has kind of more or less inhibited the progression of domain wall dynamics or the top speeds that we can hit for a number of years. And so what about the DMI is actually limiting uh, domain wall velocity? Well, it actually has to do with how the torque acts on a domain wall. So when you use a spin orbit torque to drive a domain wall into motion, not only does it drive its propagation, but it also acts to distort or cant that domain wall towards a block configuration. So the harder you drive the domain wall, the larger the torque, but also the larger the distortion. So these two effectively ba uh, balance out and you get this plateau. So how, how, uh, how high this plateau is, is really how stiff this domain wall is or how large that restoring force is on the domain wall. So essentially it's the strength of the, D the DMI which controls this plateau velocity or how stiff this domain wall is. And the DMI is actually a really hard thing to engineer the strength of. Fortunately, a few years ago, we figured out there's a way around this. You can just change the class of magnetic materials you're using to compensated systems. So we've used ferry magnetic systems, which are systems with multiple magnetic sublattices where you can very easily tune things like the net magnetization and the net angular momentum. And the more important of these two for dynamics is the net angular momentum. So I'll spare you the details, but it turns out you can actually take these equations of motion, this 1D model, and adapt them to account for the net angular momentum of the system. And when you plug in a net angular momentum of zero, you actually get an equation of motion where the velocity of the domain wall is linear with the current density and actually never saturates. You always get linear dynamics. And to prove this, we actually designed a compensated system that has zero angular momentum. And indeed, that's what we get. We get purely linear dynamics uh, where we can overcome this plateau velocity. And, and also, uh, we actually increase the mobility of the domain wall as well. And once again, going along with the theme, this is really enabled by more advanced capabilities of doing in situ measurements, looking at these domain walls as they move, as it happens. And of course, we're not the only group to realize this. Here's just an example of a few examples of other groups and papers that have done this as well. So really what limits the, uh, the motion of metallic domain walls uh, in, me in, me in metallic magnetic systems is really their mobility. So if you look at the, uh, the velocity expression and particularly look at the mobility, one of the key terms here is actually the Gilbert damping. And metallic systems, because of their conducting electrons, really suffer from large damping. So their mobilities are, are quite low. This slope is actually quite low. Fortunately, and this is where oxides come into play, uh, oxides, certain oxides, particularly garnet oxides, are very, very famous for their low damping. And so what I'll show you is by carefully designing these oxide systems in heterostructures, we can actually excite dynamics and drive these domain walls so fast that this plateau that you see here is not the same plateau that you see in ferromagnets. I'll try to argue that it's actually a relativistic limit. Uh, in fact, uh, we've reached the ultimate limit that this domain wall can move in this particular material. And, and therefore really uh, accelerate the field of domain wall dynamics. And so I'll introduce garnets just a little bit. They're a very historic classical system. Even in thin film form, they've been around for at least 60 years. 
Uh, they're very, very complicated complex oxides, uh, but magnetically speaking, they're relatively simple. There's just three magnetic sublattices. The tetrahedral iron is antiferromagnetically coupled to any rare earth dopant, and it's also antiferromagnetically coupled to the other uh, iron atoms in the octahedral sites. But the beauty of these systems is that they're incredibly tunable with composition. So depending on what element you stick here in this rare earth site, you can dramatically change the material or the magnetic properties. For example, here I just show how you can change the saturation magnetization as a function of temperature and even the compensation temperature itself, all while retaining really high Curie temperatures. You can also engineer other things. I'll show you, you can actually engineer the anisotropy in these materials as well as the damping itself. So really, uh, what, what gives, right? We've known about these materials for 60 years, so how come, we can, how come it's now that we're actually using them in these uh, applications? Well, it's really, once again, the ability to synthesize these materials with atomic precision. We can now grow these materials very, very thin, and by thin I mean on the order of one or two unit cells thick while still retaining full bulk magnetization. And what this allows us to do is really use interfaces to dictate or drive materials properties. So for example, we can use epitaxial strain and magnetostriction uh, across these interfaces to control the anisotropy and get PMA in these materials. We can drive spin torques across these interfaces using heavy metal overlayers and even that are so large that you can even switch the magnetization with currents. And more recently, we even discovered chiral interactions across interfaces, both metal oxide interfaces and oxide oxide interfaces in these materials as well. So really this system gives us all the ingredients that we need uh, for ultra-fast dynamics. So we ask the question, really, what limits the domain wall speed in a material? And that's also actually a solved problem. It was actually solved over uh, 40 years ago, about 40 years ago, um, with some very nice theoretical work. Here I just list a couple of those papers, but the list is actually quite long. And it turns out that uh, moving domain walls, they're solitons, and so they can actually mimic relativistic kinematics. And another way of saying that is, because they're solitons, they're solitaire wave packets, and they're comprised of a superposition of spin waves. So the fastest you can move a domain wall is actually the spin wave group velocity of a material. And this was actually confirmed more recently with some numerical and atomistic simulations by several groups, which not only show that this is indeed the upper bound, but they even give examples of materials that could even achieve this upper bound. And these are essentially compensated systems like the ones I've been showing you. And so the material system we chose in particular to investigate this is actually a bismuth substituted ying. We actually get rid of the rare earth because the rare earth actually increases the damping. So the advantages of this material are, once again, it has PMA. It's somewhat compensated since the ferry magnet. And once again, it has much, much lower uh, damping even than other rare earth iron garnets. The one challenge with this material system is we have a very, very hard time uh, actually introducing DMI into the system. We haven't yet been able to figure out how to do that in this particular composition. So what that means is that the domain walls are actually intrinsically immobile. They're blocked, so they won't feel the effect of the spinover torque. But we can kind of cheat and get around this. So what we do is we actually apply a pretty small in-plane field, which is larger than the domain wall anisotropy, so we can actually rotate this blocked domain wall to a nail configuration while really not affecting the bulk, so to speak, of the domains. So this is exactly what we did. We've designed racetrack-like geometries where we can nucleate domain walls, uh, apply fields to essentially uh, stabilize nail domain walls, and then drive these domain walls into motion. And in fact, we see quite fast velocities. So what you see on the left here is a plot of the domain wall velocity as a function of the current density. And you'll see it follows this kind of 1D model I showed you earlier with a linear regime and a plateau, where now this plateau is not proportional to the strength of any DMI in the system, but it's proportional to the stiffness of the domain wall, which is set by the in-plane field that we apply. So the larger in-plane field we apply, the higher this plateau uh, becomes, and it's actually uh, linear in nature. So this is the saturation velocity as a function of that in-plane field. And if you're astute, you'll notice that this y-axis is a lot larger than it was before, so we're hitting uh, domain wall velocities are thousands of meters per second, so these are more technologically relevant. But what's particularly interesting from a fundamental perspective is if we keep increasing this in-plane field, this plateau, this saturation velocity actually doesn't become any higher. These curves begin to stack up on one another. In fact, the saturation velocity itself saturates. So no matter how hard we drive this domain wall, no matter how much we stiffen that domain wall, it can't go any faster. And so this actually can't be explained by 
or couldn't be explained by any uh, existing model of domain wall dynamics, but actually can be easily explained quantitatively uh, by relativistic motion and Lorentz contraction of the domain wall. So to prove this, uh, we called on our uh, theory colleagues, so Saquon Kim and KJ Lee from KAIST, and so they actually modeled the spin wave dispersion relationship in our material using experimentally measured parameters, so nothing from the textbook, everything's from the material that we measured. And they can calculate a maximum group velocity that's about 5,000 meters per second, which is very, very close to what we see in the experiment. And so what this means is that uh, we actually have, we can actually calculate a domain wall uh, uh, Lorenz contracted width. And so they can do this analytically and they do it numerically as well, but even from the experiment, we can infer what the domain wall width is as a function of its speed. And these are plotted here on the right-hand side. And you can see both the atomistic simulation as well as the model uh, agree pretty well with what we see in the experiment. Now what this means is we actually have to adapt that fairy magnetic 1D model I showed you earlier to account for this domain wall Lorentz contraction. And so once we adapt that model, we can get an analytical uh, solution. Uh, and as well as doing uh, numerical simulations, we find that both, of the anal both the analytical simulations and the numerical modeling uh, quantitatively match what we see in the experiments. So indeed, what we are seeing here is really accessing relativistic physics on a tabletop experiment at room temperature uh, in, in a relatively accessible uh, material system. But I think importantly, this also uh, really uncovers the fundamental limit to how fast these devices can operate, what is really their operating limits, and from a fundamental perspective, we can really look at new relativistic physics uh, at a tabletop scale. Okay, and I'll just note before I move on that it's these same compensated systems that we see fast dynamics that we also see very, very small spin textures. So we can see skirmions as small as 10 nanometers in size at room temperature because they have no stray fields. And we can even move uh, domain walls and skirmions back and forth just using uh, laser pulses, no fields, no currents applied, and we're still figuring out a little bit about why this is happening. And of course, this is enabled, going back to the theme, by using in-situ imaging techniques as well as atomically precise growth. And here is my token X-ray image uh, for, the, for the talk. This is the holography image, which is the only technique that we know of uh, with X-rays that allows us to actually reveal textures of this size, 10 nanometers or so. So I'll move on to now to a different uh, oxide system. Uh, I added this in once again because I saw all of these spin wave and magnon talks, and so I hope this resonates uh, with a lot of people here. And so we'll be looking at ways we can control spin waves uh, in uh, antiferromagnetic materials. And I won't belabor the advantages or the motivation here. I'll just highlight a couple things that I think are quite interesting about spin waves. A lot of people tout the uh, low power dissipation of transmission of spin waves. I think what's particularly interesting as well as the vast number of logic operations you can do with spin waves, both linear and nonlinear computing and wave-based computing that you can open up just by using waves, as well as the scalability of these sorts of things. And I'll also point out that in antiferromagnetic systems, as well as the higher bandwidths uh, and the uh, robustness against fields, you can also play a lot of games with uh, spin wave uh, polarization as well, or handedness, I should say. And so there are a number of ways that you can actually create and detect spin waves in materials. There's a variety of coherent and incoherent ways that have been nicely outlined throughout the week. Uh, things that use optics, things that use electronics, like spin pumping. Uh, what I'll highlight today is I'll mainly focus on thermal generation, so using the spin Seebeck effect, and also uh, detection uh, using the inverse spin Hall effect. So these are incoherent mechanisms of spin wave uh, creation and detection. And so one of the more common ways to measure, not, uh, to measure spin transport is in this very well-known non-local geometry, which was first pioneered once again at Garnets. We're going back to Garnets because of their low damping, where you essentially pattern two heavy metal strip lines on the surface of a magnetic system, and one acts as a source of uh, uh, magnons, the other one acts as a drain or essentially a detector of magnons. And we detect magnons usually using the inverse spin Hall effect, and you can source magnons or spin waves uh, by a couple different ways. You can actually use spin accumulation, and this is often called the electronic means of generating spin waves, or you can just use thermal effects like uh, the spin Seebeck effect. And inevitably, both of these happen at the same time, so luckily we can kind of disentangle the two uh, by using first and second harmonics to look at each one of these individually. 
More recently, this was also seen in antiferromagnets. Everybody's favorite material, it seems, hematite, uh, has been used quite a bit, both in the easy axis geometry as well as the easy plane geometry. Uh, people have uh, uh, injected and detected spin waves. But what I want to highlight, particularly about a lot of these studies, is the ways of manipulating the spin waves from point A to point B, or how do you control what the detector sees at, at point B. And oftentimes, we use magnetic fields. Uh, in the case uh, of YIG, you're controlling the magnetic orientation, so you can control what types of spins, or if any, are injected and what types are detected, as well as uh, using fields uh, in spin, spin flop regime to control the nail vector in, in hematite. Uh, but uh, there have been some quite good means of manipulating magnons using things like gates, and I just highlight one here in particular. So they're not using magnetic fields here, but actually using um, magnetic crystals and actually taking advantage of some of the wave properties of magnons. So I like this study here. But what I'll highlight is that manipulation mechanisms are somewhat limited, so I think there's some opportunity here. I think that in particular, there's opportunity to take advantage of the logic operations of spin waves. So that's what kind of motivated uh, this uh, study that I'll show you. So the question we asked is, can we use an electric field rather than a magnetic field to manipulate magnon propagation? And so what we did was turn to the correlated oxide bismuth ferrite, which has actually already been introduced at this conference, which is great. So I'll just remind you of a few things. It's actually the only known single phase magnetoelectric material at room temperature. So what that means is actually uh, it's a ferroelectric system where the polarization points along the pseudocubic diagonal. So that's the 111 direction. And it's also a uh, G-type antiferromagnet, at least in the way that we grow this film, it's G-type antiferromagnet. So there's no spin cycloid in the films I'll show you. Uh, actually, hematite is the parent compound of BFO, so there's some familiarity to many people in this crowd. Uh, so it, is, it does have a similarly small canted moment coming from the DMI. I think the canted moment is slightly bigger in BFO because the spin orbit coupling is also slightly higher. Uh, but it's not a hexagonal system, it's actually a rhombohedral system, which is a derivative of a hexagonal system, so once again, it's similar to hematite in many ways. And this mainly comes from the distortion of the bismuth ions, as well as the very, very large octahedral rotations in the system as well. But two key takeaways that you should get from this material is that the polarization is always perpendicular to the nail vector, which is always perpendicular to the canted moment. So if you get lost, just do a right-hand rule and you'll get back on track. And the other thing to remember is that uh, it's a magnetoelectric material. So you can actually deterministically switch the canted moment by 180 degrees just by switching the polarization by 180 degrees, so by using electric fields. So our idea is really can we use bismuth ferrite to manipulate spin transport in uh, using electric fields. And this concept is not new. In fact, uh, 15 years ago, uh, Moore and D'Souza actually predicted that you could do this in bismuth ferrite uh, because of its magnetoelectric coupling. And then yeah, more than 10 years ago, yeah, more than 10 years ago, uh, a group uh, even showed that you can uh, tune the spin wave frequency of BFO with an electric field as well, uh, imaged by or measured by Raman spectroscopy. But we're interested really in, in manipulating the propagation of magnons. So what we've done, or actually one challenge with BFO that I would like to highlight, because it seems to be a recurring theme here, is that in its bulk phase, bismuth ferrite has many, many domains. In fact, the polarization is degenerate along all eight of the uh, pseudocubic uh, 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 diagonals. And so this causes a lot of problems, right? But fortunately, using epitaxy, once again, using atomically precise growth, we can grow these materials on really symmetry-breaking substrates, so to speak, so orthorhombic substrates, and cut this number of eight uh, down to just two. So we can actually uh, control the types of domains in these types of materials, and one way to do that is by strain. And why this is kind of nice is that if you, if you look closely at this picture, uh, there's actually a net polarization uh, in the plane along the zero and zero direction uh, from these two uh, different types of domains that we uh, make. And we can, I won't, I won't uh, uh, badger the details here, but we can actually directly measure the ferroelectric uh, material, uh, ferroelectric uh, orientation using uh, piezo force response microscopy, uh, which just confirms this net in, in plane polarization. And so this is actually exactly how we design our devices. So you can see the two non-local strip lines here. One's a uh, source and one's a drain. But the other advantage of this geometry is we can actually also use those contacts to apply electric fields across the sample. So we can actually control this net polarization and actually change the polarization back and forth and thereby change 
the magnetization in the material just by applying a voltage. So we'll be doing experiments where we apply a voltage and essentially measure the uh, non-local response. And like I mentioned earlier, we're mainly looking at uh, um, magnons generated by this bin Seebeck effect. And so the experiment basically looks like that. We apply an electric field, we measure the non-local voltage, and we do some techniques where we actually double check that measurement actually did not change the state of the magnet. And I'll, I'll skip those details for now. But essentially what we find is when we change the polarization back and forth in the, mag in the, in the system in bismuth ferrite, we find that the non-local voltage actually oscillates back and forth, actually changes sign as well. And this happens uh, quite reproducibly uh, as, as demonstrated by some of the, um, so the the histograms here on the right side. So why is this happening? Why are we getting actually this kind of oscillating behavior? Uh, and we can actually explain this by taking a close look once again at P, L, and M in bismuth ferrite. So these are the two different types of domains that we stabilize in bismuth ferrite. There's a lot of arrows here, so I'll walk you through this uh, pretty carefully. You can see the polarization, the net polarization from the red arrows going from right to the left. That's a net in-plane polarization. If you apply an electric field along the opposite direction, you can flip that net polarization. Now we're going from left to right. Uh, and this is called a 71 degree switch, in case you're curious. And we can even measure this and confirm that it's happening with PFM once again. Now, if you take a close look, the nail vector is actually not changing its net direction when you change the polarization. But what is changing direction is the Canton moment. So the Canton moment goes from going from uh, right to left uh, to left to right. So we change the um, Canton moment by, net Canton moment by 180 degrees. This might be more easily seen if I just show you kind of the projection along the 0, 1, 0 plane, which is shown right here. The polarization goes from right to left on one voltage and left to right on the other, and the Canton moment also changes its net direction as well. Uh, and so basically what this means is that what we are actually implying from this measurement is that the spin waves actually propagate along the Canton moment, and by flipping the sign of the Canton moment, you'll flip the sign of the inverse spin hall effect output. Uh, and so we can actually do a hysteresis of this as well. So we can uh, do electric field pulses of different magnitudes while measuring the non-local voltage in between. And what we find is we get a nice hysteresis of the non-local voltage, which once again changes sign, and the coercivity closely matches the coercivity of the polarization of the bismuth ferret as well. So these are quite correlated. Some quick control measurements. So we did the same thing on YIG, which is not a ferroelectric, but it's magnetic. Of course, we see no ferroelectric loop, and we see no change in the non-local signal. So this tells us it's nothing about the circuitry that's causing this effect, so it's not an artifact with capacitance or anything like that. And the final check is we took a um, lead doped strontium titanate, which is an in-plane ferroelectric, very similar to bismuth ferrite, did the same measurement. Of course, you get a nice ferroelectric loop, but you don't see any non-local change because it's not magnetic. So this confirms that it's not any weird dielectric effects that we're seeing uh, that are causing this effect. It's actually truly changing uh, the magnon propagation with an electric field. And so I think I'm over time already, so I'll end there. I'll summarize again, very broadly speaking, that we can use advanced growth and in-situ characterization to study these ferroic excitations by taking advantage of their novel functionalities and hopefully seeing some new materials physics. So I'll thank again uh, all of the collaborators really across the world, including the pastor groups I was in, Jeff's group at MIT, Ramesh's group at Berkeley, and I'll particularly highlight Eric Parsonet, who did the bulk of the measurements on that last experiment I showed you. And I can't end without a selfish plug. I just started a group uh, at Brown two months ago. So if you or anybody you know is interested in growing perfect materials and measuring them in cool ways, let me know. I'm hiring at all levels. Uh, come talk to me or send me an email. So with that, I'll, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Luca, for your very interesting.